Welcome to hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, where you get to ask me, or well, normally us, but me questions. And you can ask them on any of the videos across the off-road, heck, even roadside, really. But just use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and we'll find your questions. And we've got our first question now. Okay, first question is from Eddie Marin. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, he's recently switched his rear brake from a Tetro hydraulic brake to a Shimano. Um, but he says the hose was far too long and he didn't want to shorten it. Um, is it an issue that it's going to be wrapped around his head tube? I mean, yes, it probably is going to be an issue. Why? Well, if you've got excess hose, you're more likely to snag it on a bush or snag it on a bit of fence and that could stop you really quickly. It could damage your hose. If you've set your bike up to do sort of funky bar tricks and, and, and bar spins, the like that Toff would talk about on the Dirt Shed Show, then yeah, you can have some to wrap the, the bars around. But if you've just set it up and you're not doing lots of rad tricks, then yeah, trim that hose. We've got loads of great videos on GMBN Tech about how to trim your hose and how to bleed your brakes, but do it before you damage your hose. Okay, great. Another question here. This one is from Tom P, 8140. Um, is there a next step from being just a local bike mechanic? Well, he's currently working in a bike shop. Um, he says it's great fun, of course. Uh, the pay is tight, unfortunately. Um, is there any way to do this but get paid more to do what he loves. In short, yeah, there is. The world is your oyster. Um, the world needs bike mechanics. Um, and I'll say, uh, sort of, I guess, a bit of career advice really, is that um, there's always room to grow in the bike industry. There's always new stuff coming out. So if you're that guy in the bike shop that knows the newer stuff first, that's a real advantage. Um, obviously, if you're in a small local bike shop and you're dreaming of bigger things, look to get more and more experience. If that means that you're gonna work uh, on the weekends, it may be a, with a racer, local racer. Racers always need help. Um, sometimes they're not the mechanically best out there. So work with a local racer. There might be a local race on. Uh, so you could help there and do some sort of free mechanic service. Okay, some of it won't be very fun, but you'll get lots and lots of experience. And that's the key thing is to keep learning and keep sort of trying your hand at new stuff. Um, I guess, yeah, in terms of other advice is, yeah, if you've got dreams and aspirations, getting that kind of, that CV of work experience of helping racers and helping at races or helping volunteer at events is great. And pitch out to teams. They often need uh, extra mechanics if they're in different places. Um, so yeah, keep working really hard and hopefully you'll get there. I guess the key thing to remember even when you're working on a really crusty bike and for somebody who might not be the most cheery of customers is that you're helping them get their headspace out of work or you're getting somebody to and from work and that's super important you're doing something that is incredibly rewarding um, and i'm not saying that because you should get paid less i'm just saying that there's not that many jobs that are so rewarding that you can problem solve fix and get somebody back on the road so keep trying Keep shouting out about that you want a bit more in your work and maybe ask some teams as well. We've got a great question here from Neil Chandry and it's a great question because, well, for different reasons from normal, but we'll carry on and I'll explain why it's a great question. So his drivetrain seems to squeak, but only when I'm in my lowest gears. Um, do we know why? So I guess the first part of that we can explain, and this is why it's a great question, and it's something that Calvin mentioned as well is, give us more information, give us as much info as you can on any of the questions. So this one is lowest gears. Do you mean lowest ratio, so the biggest cogs at the back, or do you mean the lowest, smallest cogs on the back? Without that kind of information, it's a little bit tricky, but we can have a really good guess as to what's happening. Potentially, it's your chain is a little bit worn. So with one bar drivetrains, if you're looking from the back of the bike to the front of the chain ring and your eye line is in line, with the chain ring, you can see how much the chain is kind of like warping from one way and sort of almost weaving down the other way. So there's lots of side loads on modern chains. And if you're used to sort of a two by system, you might not realize how much load your chain goes through and how actual, yeah, you need to replace your chains a lot more often with one by setups, especially the sort of 12 speed and maybe more so with electronic gears because they just shift and shift and you might not have that subtle feedback that you used to get with a mechanical setup. So that would be my first question back is kind of which 
and what system are you using and where is the noise? But we can look at chain length. You can get measuring devices to check that. Next thing is it could be as simple as lube. So do a thorough clean and then re-lube. And depending on what conditions you're in, whether it's dry or whether it's really wet or just mix conditions, use the right chain lube because that will make a really big difference to your performance. Your question then goes on a little bit more. He's got a Canyon Lux and the chain guide keeps dropping into the chain. Even though he's fully tightened it, it actually starts to rotate when he's tightened it up. So for those who don't know, the Canyon Lux is their top tier XC World Cup race bike. So it's 110, I think, on the front, 100 mil on the back. There is the, the Lux Trail, which is a longer travel one, but, but this is just the Lux. And as you might imagine on an XC bike, it's got a really minimal chain device. So it's not big and bulky, it's just very slim line. And as you might imagine of something that's super lightweight, it also doesn't need that much newton meters or that much torque to make sure it's tight. But often what can happen is, especially with a chain guide that's gonna get some friction, it's gonna get the occasional knock, it's gonna get chatted about a lot. Potentially what's happened is you've, it's come loose, you've kind of backed it out, retightened it, maybe the bit of Loctite, so that's like a surface prep for the, the bolt that goes in there. Um, actually screw, I apologize. The screw that goes in there to hold it in. Maybe that's worn off. So first step is undo that, have a look at the screw thread. Is it just bare thread? Is the thread nice and tight on there? Because what might have happened is if you've over torqued it, I checked on the website and I think it's only three newton meters. So it's quite a low measurement. That's less than you would need to tighten your brake levers, for example, which is around four. So if you've over tightened it, you could have stripped that that bolt. So first step is check those threads and if they're screwed up, maybe it's new bolt time. If the bolt is okay, just apply a bit of Loctite. A medium thread lock should be suffice um, and get it back in there and it should be good. In terms of other things back to the kind of noisy bike, again, without more information, it's trickier, but have a look while you're at the back of the bike about the mech hanger and see if that's bent or twisted because sometimes that can mean that the mech's out of alignment and it's causing it to rub. Have a look at limit screws, but the reason why I really like this question is one of those questions where it just gets you thinking about, oh, what could it be? And if you're writing to us on the hashtag ask GMBN Tech, give us as much info as you can, because the more info we've got, hopefully we can track down and solve the problem for you. Great question here from our friend Tim. Hello, Tim, love your questions. This one is all about swapping out tires. So he's asking, he sees teams swapping out tires as con conditions change at races. Uh, that was quite easy for me to say, but harder to type, obviously. Um, you never see the mess of kind of taking tubeless tires off and sealant on the floor. Are there secret hacks that the World Cup teams do, or do they just hide it all? Uh, and he's also guessing that the sealant's never saved to be used again. Um, well, I mean, actually, yeah, there, there are some tips, there are some tricks, and. I can share some of them um, without revealing too much and getting into trouble with other World Cup mechanics. Um, so brief history, I used to spanner at World Cups, uh, just downhills really, but I've watched the XC race mechanics from afar. Uh, mess is made, but, but pro mechanics are really good. We're quite good at cleaning stuff up. So we will clean mess up. We will, on occasions, reuse sealant. I mean, the key thing with reusing sealant is to make sure that you're getting all those biofibers with PTs, it's the small particles, but other brands have got different types of particles across from one tire to other, because that's the sort of magic stuff. I know with downhill, you could swap a fair bit over. Um, lots of race mechanics when I was doing, which is quite a few years back now, were, were adding things to, to sealants because they weren't like PTs. They didn't have the variety of different bits in. So you had to add bits. Um, so yeah, you would transfer lots of bits over. Yeah, Tim, great question. Um, hopefully we can kind of reveal more secrets when we go to more World Cups later this year. Great question here. This is from that guy and he asks, will putting helium in my tires make my bike lighter? And I mean, the short answer is yes. Unfortunately, that lighter bike will only last for a short time too. Why? Because helium as a molecule is small. It's very small, actually. Uh, it is lighter than air, which is why those balloons float up. Um, so you're right in thinking that we could make lighter bikes by filling it with helium. The problem is, is keeping the helium inside your tires. There's been lots of research done. All the stuff I could find, to be fair, it was all about butyl tubes and about race car tires for Formula One and Le Mans style cars. But essentially those tires can't hold helium because it's a really small particle. Um, I guess there's similarities between butyl tubes and latex. Latex 
is a lighter material. So if you're still using tubes, um, there's some advantages doing latex because it's lighter, it's got less hysteresis, so when it flexes, it doesn't sort of absorb as much energy. I'm butchering the physics, so please correct me where, where possible. Problem is with latex, a bit like if you put helium in your regular tubes or in your tubeless setup, it, it loses air, it's quite porous. Um, so I've heard in Formula One cars and in NASCAR and some top tier pro road teams are using nitrogen um, to fill, fill their tires. And that means that it's more stable, um, so it's less likely to be affected by humidity. Um, and it also, because of that particle size, it's a bigger particle, so it's gonna stay at that PSI that you put in uh, for longer. Um, I mean, that's why they're using it in shocks as well, is so that we don't have this mix of oil and air and, and this kind of leaching of, of liquids. Um, so yeah, you could put nitrogen in. It's quite a lot of faff to be fair, but you can do it if you want to, but helium not yet. I should probably chat with Peaches and see if PT sealant is helium proof or not. But uh, yeah, get your next question in. Okay, good question here. This is from IDK. Okay, it's a long name, it's up there on the, on the screen. He's asking, he's searching for a used enduro bike, but should he actively avoid dampers with rubber bladders like the Charger 2.1? There's a few others out there too. I've heard the rubber can break. How common is this to happen? Is it, is it good to search for a damper that doesn't use a rubber bladder, um, that, that are not prone to breaking as often? Um, it's a tricky one. I think no is, is the immediate answer. I think if you're buying an enduro bike, um, don't dismiss bikes that have got certain dampers. Um, I mean, so a little brief history about these dampers. So effectively, when you, we're controlling uh, a spring, more often than not, even an enduro fork, that's an air spring, we're going to use oil as the damping medium. And that's the thing that's kind of controlling the spring from just pogoing around. And that's where all the really clever science is. And that's where, whether it be Fox or RockShox or SR Suntour, are spending lots of money in development time. Um, and there's lots of different ways of making sure that the oil stays as oil. Um, as you may have done, you may have got a kind of a fancier milk frother for your coffee. Bear with me, this is a tangent. You can, yeah, have a sort of like a cafetiere plunger, if you're Australian, to plunge coffee. You can also use that to shake up and make frothy milk. Well, that's what can happen if you don't have either a floating uh, internal piston, so an IFP, or one of these special rubber bladders to help control the expansion of the oil, is that you can have oil and air in the same place. And effectively, you don't want that because you can get cavation. And that means you've effectively got lots of little bubbles in the oil, and that means the oil isn't acting like it should do. So you'll get really inconsistent damping. So that's a not very brief, brief synopsis on these different systems. There's pros and cons to both. I mean, a lot of them will start at a design level and they'll start off as a, a sort of a, a bladder damper setup. Others will start as an IFP. Sometimes it might have been an IFP to start with and then as a later upgrade, it's been switched to one of these, these rubber dampers. Effectively, they're both doing a really similar job. There's pros and cons to both. On a, on a dyno, you might see, so that's a, a machine to check how a shock absorber or fork works, and it'll give you an actual readout of the force at various points versus just your eye squishing up and down in it. On a dyno, there is said to be subtle differences between the two, but once you're riding, I don't think there is huge differences. I phoned my friend uh, Jake at Sprung to get more advice, and he was really helpful in just sort of saying, yes, there are differences, subtlety differences in feels on the, on the road or on the trail. But he said the bigger difference isn't really about which damper you go for, whether you go for the rubber bladder or you go for the IFP, it's more how that bike's been ridden, and that's more of the concern. So if you're hunting for a new enduro, secondhand, but new to you enduro bike, I would say the biggest thing is, has it been rallied? Has it been rallied really hard? Like has Rich Payne raced it at a World Cup enduro? Uh, if so, yeah, potentially step away or just be really mindful that whether it's got a, a bladder damping system or it's got an IFP, those are gonna need to get serviced. I mean, even if the bike has had a really gentle time for an enduro bike and it's only been out on the occasional fair weather Sunday, I think probably the first upgrade or first thing I'd look to do about getting a second hand bike is getting the shock and getting the, the forks off to get serviced. Lots of different systems have got different service intervals. Remember, Fox is about 
30 hours, RockShox is about 50 hours. That's only for a lower leg or air can service, which you could do at home, but if we're talking bladders and we're talking second hand, those bikes have kind of been around a while and probably raced relatively hard. So yeah, don't worry about which damper it's got. Look for the right frame for you in terms of all the performance and features that you need. Look for the right fitting frame because yeah, fit is essential. You know, the difference in sizing can make a real difference. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much about the suspension units. If you get, you know, good ones from good brand names, you will be able to get them serviced. So yeah, enjoy shopping. Let us know which one you go for and um, yeah, keep asking us questions. Fun question here from Sepster. 58. Uh, can you explain the purpose of a real derailleur clutch? Uh, when to use it? I'm a bit curious after checking the videos on removing a rear wheel. Love the show. Uh, well, thank you. Great question. Um, yeah, that's why we're here. That's why you can send in our questions to hashtag AskGMBNTech, is we're here to answer your questions. Um, you know, uh, me, Anna, Blake, all the team have got huge amounts of experience, whether it's actually racing at World Cups, like Neil has, or Enduros, like Rich Payne has, or backflipping back flipping pretty much any bike uh, like Blake has, or, you know, me and Anna who are a bit techy and nerdy. Um, so, great question about clutch. So, okay, in short, the clutch is a mechanism on a rear mech that stops the cage just pulling forward. Um, and that's great because as your bike sort of hee haws through rough terrain, it then limits how much your chain can bounce around and possibly bounce off your chain ring. Um, so I guess the, the drawbacks of them is that in the stand and probably on, on the trail a little bit, there is a mild change to how they feel and shifting smoothness. So you have to, if you're on cable still, you have to kind of force past that clutch to make sure that the the gear shifts up into the next sprocket, so you have to overcome that force. But the boost to chain retention is mind-blowing. Early days of downhill and early days of one by systems were hampered by chains that fell off. And often there was ultra complicated, almost like a second front mech on the front of the bike and almost kind of like a moving special jockey wheel thing to keep the chain on. And with a clutch, it does so much. So depending on which brand of rear mech you've got, you're going to have different approaches to removing a rear wheel and turning the clutch on and off. With SRAM, the clutch is on. That's it. It's just on. When you take your rear wheel out, you can put the cage lock on, which effectively locks that cage in a, a static position so it's a bit more dangly and it makes getting the rear wheel out much easier. Um, whereas on Shimano's and some other systems, you've got actually an on-off lever, which sort of actuates the clutch to be in an on position where that cage can't pull forwards, or we've got it in an off position where the cage has got loads of free movement. Um, so yeah, they're really integral into modern mountain bikes and, and one by. So yeah, clutches are brilliant. Super, that wraps up this round of hashtag AskGMBN Tech, which is a mouthful. But if you've got any questions at all about anything off-road, even drop bar off-road, then feel free to use the hashtag hashtag AskGMBN Tech, to ask us questions. We're here to help you.